So I was saying, I was saying that um, IR scholars, uh, as early as in 1960s, realized that, and this was when um, behavioral revolution in the world uh, would argue that uh, international relations would be, should be studied from a rational perspective and data is very, very important. So, so IR scholars such as Singer decided to get together a database and in that database they actually came up with empirical data that they gathered from yearbooks and encyclopedias uh, and, and, and historical accounts of wars. So they actually listed um, each war and the dyads, meaning two states uh, getting into war with one another. Okay, So think of, I'm just giving you a very basic idea of how this is actually done, okay? Just think of it as Britain and then Germany, okay? And then at what year did they fight against one another? Well, for example, okay, 1914 and then 1915, and so you write all the years before and after, if any, these uh, two states fought with one another. Or you could write Ottoman Empire and, or Britain and Ottoman Empire, and then start writing uh, the years that these uh, states fought against one another. Now imagine forming a database like this with all the wars that all the countries in the world got into war with one, one another since 1816, okay, until today. This is called the Correlates of War database. People actually like to call it COW. And this database inspires other databases. Like I said, people at the time started uh, forming these databases so that they can do more rational and positivist analyses with these databases and also statistical analyses as well. And then with uh, the uh, polity database, uh, scholars were able to look at the effect of regime type on wars. Now imagine you have this already done and then you decide to look at regime type of state one. State one means the first state. Okay? And then you look at the regime type of state two. I'm giving you a rough idea. It doesn't exactly look like this, okay? But this is the logic of making this, this database. So the regime type of state one in 1914, Britain, was a democracy. Regime type of state, one, uh, state two uh, in 1914, Germany, was not a democracy, an authoritarian state. And um, the, the, the polity data actually gave scores to the level of democracy that these states would uh, have, okay? So uh, there's a scale, and in that scale, there are several criteria, such as uh, civil liberties or executive uh, duties and uh, the legislative. So there are many, many criteria that form the definition of a democracy. They formed this, this uh, database, and what we now call the Democratic Peace Scholars uh, made the observation, empirical observation, that with this particular definition of democracy, two states, since 1816, two states that are democracies never fought with one another. Like I said, 
This is an empirical observation that is done using a certain definition of democracy, the definition that they used. Okay? So with this definition, uh, with this uh, hypothesis, the next thing to do is, okay, this is my observation, but why is this so? Why do I observe this? I showed you the first uh, uh, causal mechanism, the first theoretical approach to the observation that two democracies won't fight. And that one was that leaders are socialized in democracies differently than leaders uh, and people socialized in non-democracies. Yes? Uh, I believe the question which should be asked to the democracy theorists is that were they really we are going to get to it. <laughs> I know, I know. We are getting there. Just bear with me. Taha, bear with me. I am getting there. After the next slide, I, am, I will be there, okay? So the second explanation of democratic peace scholars is an institutional approach to democratic peace. So the situation is this. I have this observation. I look at all these cases since 1816. I see that two democracies haven't fought with one another. How do I explain this? The first explanation is the normative approach. The norms of democracy, socialization in democracy, creates an internal constraint that uh, prevents two democracies from white, fighting with one another. The second explanation is institutional constraints. So this time, the constraint, the thing that prevents me from fighting as a democracy has nothing to do with my childhood experiences, my brothers, my sisters, all the stories that I told you uh, last hour. That's not it. It is all about the institutional uh, constraints that will stop me from fighting. So in this sense, the leaders, it's a very rational explanation in that sense. The leaders are trying to maximize gains and minimize costs. That's what rationality is in international relations. Okay? So the leaders want to remain in power. Let me ask you something. You know, if you become the prime minister, would you actually like to stay in power once you become the prime minister? Absolutely. You don't, you don't even say yes or no. You said absolutely. Once I'm the prime minister, that actually, why? Let me ask you, why? Because everybody likes power. Everybody likes what? Power. Uh, economic policy. Okay. So there are many advantages of being the prime minister or the, the party in power in a democracy. What is it? Let's just think about it. Why would a leader want to stay in power? You were saying something. There are privileges. Okay. What kind of privileges? Uh, parliamentary immunity. But you have that even when you are just a, a, a parliamentarian, right? So even as a deputy in the parliament, you have immunity. So you don't have to be the prime minister for that. You're rich. Okay. Here's the thing. In a, in, a, um, in a real democracy, I would say that, you know, your being a prime minister should not actually uh, mean that you become rich or your family to become rich. So that's kind of like a, a, a less, uh, less uh, consolidated democracy. What else, though? You can control everything, okay? When I say you, when I say you, or when you say you, you actually mean, you know, the, the cabinet. It's not one person, but the cabinet uh, actually controls a lot. Okay, not everything, but a lot. How will the, the economy in the country function? Um, are we going to, uh, I'm, I'm talking from the, perspective of Turkey, are we going to do something about, do more about uh, accessing the, the European Union? 
Are we going to, let me think of the hot issues in Turkey today. Are we going to give, um, give um, uh, the bedelli uh, askerlik, the military service is now um, uh, limited to paying a lot of money and so you won't actually even go for 21 days, um, which actually doesn't cover anyone in this crowd, right? As long as the economy is flowing towards my pocket and my to the pocket of my circle, mm -hmm. I don't care what's going on. That's you from from the leader's perspective. Yes. Okay, that's one view. What else? What else can you control? Let me tell you something. I was actually uh, when I was traveling to to uh, NATO two days ago. I actually flew business class. And uh, I mean, I'm a college professor. I don't fly in business class very often, right? Obviously. So, oh my God, it was so good. It was just so comfortable. What? <laughs> yes, they did give me orange juice. <laughs> but that wasn't the only thing. As soon as I sat, they gave me champagne. You know, orange juice was, was just not even, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> We're talking about champagne and, and um, uh, all these fancy, fancy food and all that. So, um, and I like to eat. I mean, you can tell. So in that sense, you feel when you uh, travel business class, you feel that you can do anything. There is an incredible sense of power. And I only traveled, traveled for what? I mean, it's three hours. <laughs> so my reign uh, lasted only three hours. Um, and it was just a um, business flight. And it was just, and on the way back, we, we flew economy. <laughs> so <laughs> NATO sources was, was enough for, the, 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 for only one way. Um, so in that sense, guys, it was, uh, uh, I am coming to, to, to a, a, an interesting point here. I felt incredibly privileged, incredibly rich, and uh, incredibly pr uh, prestigious, and uh, all these, you know, all these nice things, like I can do anything, like Kevin Costner. Remember the <laughs> Turkish Airlines uh, ad? There was a c commercial with Kevin Costner, and also there was Kvanç Tatatu, and they were covering him, right, with, with a blanket. No one covered me with a blanket, but I felt like the, the hostesses can, can any moment come and cover me uh, if I was cold. Um, so it was an incredible sense of uh, being in charge of power. Like I said, I mean, it didn't last, but, but still for that time being, I actually felt that you know, it was very nice to have that power. Because you are being respected. Because you are being, okay, I'm going to, to actually tell you one more funny thing about the, the trip and that will be it. I actually gave my, um, my passport on the way to the, the plane. I gave my passport uh, first and I looked at my passport and they're not smiling and all that. And then I gave my, my boarding cap, uh, pass and the next moment the guy <laughs> is like, welcome, oh it's so nice to see you here. It's almost like he knows me, and of course he doesn't, you know? Uh, I'm not that famous. So um, I actually did uh, definitely feel more respected. Now what does that mean? It is an illusion, of course. I mean, if you're not a person who continuously flies uh, business uh, in all uh, the trips, then it's just an illusion. Next week I'll have to go uh, uh, somewhere again and I'm not flying business, so I'm not going to uh, live the same experience. Now, the leader, if you look at this from that perspective, the leader will want to stay in power uh, as long as he can, he or she can. Okay, so the leader then will desire his political party to remain in power. And I'm not talking about personal privileges. I'm actually talking about the institutional privilege of being the incumbent party, the party in government. Okay, because you have the control of a lot of things. And of course, they also fly business all the time, right? Um, so the leaders have supporters. But also, the leaders have uh, opposition. 
So um, our uh, government, uh, AKP, has uh, opposition parties like CHP, like uh, MHP. So these supporters of the, the government party versus the opposition of the, the government party uh, will be watching what is going on. So the, the goal, the, the duty of the opposition parties and the leaders is to punish the government or to try to catch the mistakes, the weaknesses of the government party. That's what democracy is about. Opposition and government. The opposition watches the government. The government tries to do the right moves so that the opposition will not catch any mistakes. And then as a result, the government can be re-elected. If the government makes mistakes that are caught by the opposition parties, then the government is not supposed to be re-elected. That's what democracy is about, isn't it? That's what uh, the political system is about. So opposition groups then uh, will not uh, want to tolerate costly victories or failures. So re uh, remember we were saying that sometimes, you know, uh, in a democracy, if I win the war but I lost half the class, some of you were saying I don't want you anymore because the opposition groups will not <clears throat> let you, the leader, uh, to, to just uh, go on with the policies. And wars, if, if uh, the war uh, is, is won through a costly victory, if the worst case scenario, the war is, is uh, lost, then that is really not good for the, the government. Okay? So the government does not want to lose wars. So the political system in a democracy will encourage the existence of opposition and um, the opposition will be less likely to support military operations, okay? If it is going to be too costly. Um, in the case of, uh, by the way, it, depending on the ideology of the opposition, that may not be always true, right? So in the case of um, Turkey sending troops um, to other parts of the, the world, Sometimes the opposition wants it and the government doesn't want it and sometimes it's just the, the opposite. Uh, during the Korean War, this is actually quite interesting, uh, during the Korean War, the opposition becomes very much upset that the government decides to send uh, troops to, to uh, Korea and it doesn't actually, the government doesn't actually even bring the matter to the parliament. You know, the, the uh, cabinet just decides, and the president also just decide that uh, soldiers will be sent to Korean War. And then the opposition learns about it afterwards, and there is a huge uh, debate about it. But after the troops are sent, remember the rally around the flag effect? Everybody gets together, there's solidarity, and then the opposition uh, cuts the opposition and they start supporting uh, the operation after the troops are, are actually sent. So guys, in a democracy, we expect then the, the political system, the institution of elections to prevent the leader or to prevent the government from going to war with another democracy, okay? And also, Let's just assume that it's again uh, Hussein and I, and you're a democracy and I'm a democracy. I have elections, you have elections. You know, if I, let's just assume that I'm the US, you're Britain. Imagine that we're trying to explain to our public that as US and Britain, we're getting into a conflict over, you know, something that we can't get along. Or let's just assume that America and Canada. Do America and Canada ever have problems? Sure they did, and, and they, they sometimes still do. You don't really hear about these problems because according to this explanation, they never go to war. And the reason for that is the American public or the Canadian public would not let their leaders to get into a war with one another 
And the reason for that is they would vote the leaders out. Imagine the US and Canada getting into a war with one another. But um, maybe, uh, Sumin, you can, uh, have you ever heard of any problems between Canada? Have you ever heard of acid rain? Yes. Okay, not the song. There's a song, but not the song. So was there a problem between Canada and the US because of acid rain? Okay, so the problem is, you know, the industrial areas in the, the border close to Canada and the United States, um, because of the heavy industry in those areas, uh, acid will start raining on Canada. The acid, uh, as a result of U.S. industry, will, will actually come down on, on Canada, and Canada will be very upset as a result of that. And then, you know, there will be negotiations on how to limit that. Now, why don't we actually know about this? Well, it's about environment. That might be one, one, ex, uh, one explanation. Well, it's about environment. Yeah, but it, it actually caused quite a problem between the US and uh, Canada, because Canada actually was, was uh, uh, quite hurt as a result of the, the situation, uh, especially in the 1990s. So guys. You're Canada, and I'm US, because I'm more powerful. Um, and we actually decide that our public will punish us with the institution, through the institution of elections, if we decide to go uh, to war with one another. So this explanation of democratic peace, the observation that two democracies don't fight with one another, will say, OK. It's not internal constraints such as socialization of the, or the norms that the leader actually believes in. Instead, it is institutions that will um, in, uh, exert a, 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 an outside pressure on the leader. Okay? So it's not me thinking, oh, but I should negotiate with Hussein. It's actually my constituency and the opposition outside, not from my inside, but outside the, the opposition that stops me because I would like to get reelected. Let me tell you something. It's very rare in democracies that a leader will not, uh, will not run for a second term. Most, in most democracies, and in authoritarian states, by the way, I mean, the, the leader does not even run in elections, or they do, but there's only one party, <laughs> so there's an opposition. So each and every leader will want to remain in power, both in authoritarian states and in democracies. But in democracies, because there's the institution of elections, we know for a fact that uh, the, the leader will want to, to win the elections. Let me add one more thing to this. Let's imagine that the leader will not want, okay, let's just uh, look at Turkey again. If uh, our prime minister, uh, Erdogan, does not want to rerun in the next uh, upcoming elections, guys, would he decide to get into a war? Restlessly, uh, recklessly? Let's just assume that personally, individually, he decided Due to health reasons, he does not want to rerun in elections. Would then the government get, uh, decide to get into uh, a war? Okay. Okay. So when I say leader, I want you to think of any leader, not that particular leader of, of a party for that particular time period. Think of it as the party. Erdogan would never decide to do something crazy, recklessly, uh, as getting Turkey into a, a, a war, um, because he would want, after him, even if he's not going to be uh, re-elected or he's not going to rerun in elections, he would not want to hurt his party. So this explanation does not only look at the individual or the leader, it also looks at the institution, the political party the government, okay? Is this clear? 
everyone can answer that there are two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is Immanuel Kant's systemic hypothesis. As the state, uh, as a st uh, state becomes a democracy, then uh, that state will be more pacific. And the explanation for that was the pacific public explanation, meaning the public will bear the cost, so they won't want to get into a war. The second hypothesis we mentioned today was two democracies will not fight uh, with one another, will be less likely to fight with one another. But a democracy will be quite, uh, as likely to fight with a non-democracy. Always remember Hussein and I and then Orkun and I. With a non-democracy, I can fight. Okay? With a democracy, I don't. That is our empirical observation that um, the, the democratic peace scholars have done through a uh, polity uh, database these days. Okay? They keep updating these databases. They keep running their analyses using these databases. There were two explanations for the democratic peace. The first one was the normative, norms-based approach. It's the norms and socialization of the leaders that prevent them internally from taking part in, in uh, wars with other democracies. And the second explanation was the institutional approach, which said it's not an internal constraint, but an uh, external constraint, which uh, is institutions that limit the leader. Okay, now I come to your point. Did you make the point in your assignment? Yes. I'm not finished with this, reading the, the assignments because um, I forgot to take them to my business uh, trip. Uh, it would be very fun to have my champagne and my papers. <laughs> but it would, it would, it would, everyone would understand that I'm a college professor then, so I'm glad I, did, I, I forgot the, the papers. Uh, I actually read some, some important book instead. <laughs> And they brought me a lot of newspapers, and there were movies. Okay. Um, until my next business uh, trip, I'll be talking about it. Okay. So uh, the next thing that we should discuss is what is the problematic issues pertaining to democratic peace? Is there anything problematic? Oh, what is not problematic about it? As I said, this is an international relations, um, uh, well, these are international relations uh, uh, theories to uh, approaches to democratic peace from a liberal perspective. So if you are not subscribing to, believing in the liberal international relations theory, then this is not going to be a very um, uh, credible credible explanation of why two states don't fight and why there cannot be perpetual peace in the world. Say if you are a realist or a new realist, and if you believe that power politics is what drives the international system instead of things like regime type, then you're actually going to believe that, you know, regime type will have no effect on whether two countries will fight or not. So uh, what might be another explanation that Hussein and I don't fight? From a realist perspective? What do realists believe? One of them is weaker than the other side. Okay, power. Yes? There is strategic interest as to why you wouldn't fight and also uh,
Okay. So the first objection would be, from a realist perspective, hey, you get into a war for purposes of, or, for, uh, or as a result of power relations. Have these guys say anything about power relations? Not really. They actually connected the fact that two states go to war with one another with the internal dynamics, domestic politics of a state. Exactly, so uh, taking public opinion quite seriously or taking institutions, domestic institutions quite seriously, okay? So the argument here is a state level argument. From a system level argument, a neorealist like Kenneth Waltz would say, let me see, let me look at the, the power structure of this system. How many great powers are there? in this system. Are there um, two great powers, five great powers? Are there common interests? So the key here from a realist perspective would be common interests. What common interests do, do I have with Hussein? Uh, okay, you have something that I want and, and um, I have something, some resource that you want. So that's common interest that has nothing to do with our regime type from a realist perspective, okay? But you, you need to understand that um, democratic peace scholars are working with a certain definition of war and certain definition of democracy. That brings me to that point that I was uh, making earlier. So war, definition, and definition of democracy. In the definition of democracy that these guys are working with, um, when you look at some cases that look like the state is a democracy, this definition of democracy says no, that state is not really a democracy. One example is, is um, uh, the American Spanish Wars. <clears throat> And another problem is uh, with the definition of war. What you mentioned, uh, Jalal, was uh, intervention from that perspective. War would require two states actively fighting with one another. Intervention would be one state intervening in the other state's uh, territory, or if it's diplomatic intervention, you, uh, you don't even have to uh, fight at all. But intervention is different than war. So the, 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 this, this literature, the uh, democratic peace literature, that is looking at the wars that conform with its definition of wars and democracies that conform with its definition of democracies. But, I mean, we have been objecting the, the, to the argument, but don't forget that for the definition of, of these guys, there are many, many cases that fit the definition. And in those many, many cases, with those uh, criteria of democracy, there were no wars. Okay, so even if we're going to crit uh, criticize democratic peace uh, uh, explanations, we still need to at least accept from a more objective perspective that there are cases, uh, a lot of cases that fit, okay? But in the meantime, Russet in your uh, reader also uh, argues that there have been people who said there are cases that, fun, that uh, do not fit the definition, okay? The, the, the explanation. So, yes. Okay, so yeah, it is intervention and this is war, but nonetheless, even when it's talking about war, well, why does it say these countries don't go to war? And it goes back to a basic premise about how uh, voters view our democracies. Mm -hmm. So then, even though intervention and maybe the most of their situation is not a war, but uh, nonetheless, if we go back to that same basic premise, why isn't that same basic premise of you know, uh, voters not wanting to stand in the way of democracy or being some kind of great ideal for, for voters mm -hmm. and for the nation. Why doesn't that extend to these cases of interventions? Uh, I, I think that it's 
possibly a constructivist perspective might be relevant because, well, these democracies that we're looking at all generally have come from the same region of the world. They've all been Western democracies, mm -hmm. so they've developed uh, in the same way at around the same time, uh, and they've all kind of, well, at one point, well, not all, but many of them were the former, former colonial masters. There's a very mm -hmm. different power dynamic here, and so, yes, those, and so these colonial these former colonial masters are less likely to get into conflict to war with, with uh, Eastern nations because it's an uneven playing field. It would be an intervention and not a war. But nonetheless, I don't think that uh, conflicts with that argument. Um, from, a, from a constructivist perspective, um, let's just take EU. Okay? Why do EU states uh, don't fight with one another? Um, from a liberal perspective, you could argue that because they're all democracies and two democracies do not fight with one another. So Germany and France do not fight with one, uh, one another at this point because they're democracies. And uh, so you can argue using democratic peace why France and Germany don't fight. But then from a constructivist perspective, you can look at the same exact issue and you can argue that it is not really being a democracy, but it is the identity that these countries have formed under the umbrella of the European Union. So as European Union member states, they're not going to fight with one another because they have created the identity of Europeanness. And Europeanness requires that the European states do not fight with one another. But in the meantime, the constructivists do uh, argue that democracy, being a democracy, creates a, 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 um, um, so, a society where common norms are shared. So in democracies, um, from a constructivist perspective, yes, you do share norms and you create norms through international organizations or other entities such as European Union. Okay? So, constructivist perspective is kind of closer to the liberal perspective because it values democracy as a norm creating um, uh, form of government. Okay? And in a true democracy, well, yeah, I, I would agree that um, states would actually uh, would not want to fight with one another. But, from a constructivist perspective, it is quite problematic, again, that you define democracy in a certain way. Let me ask you another question. EU uh, has set Copenhagen criteria for Turkey. And we have not really been able to um, uh, keep up with those standards yet. Can we argue that there is one way of democracy that fits every society. That is an objection to uh, the Copenhagen criteria from a constructivist perspective. Each society, each culture is not the same. So can we actually take the, the Copenhagen uh, criteria and just fit it in every country that will be uh, joining the EU? Let me uh, give you uh, an objection from the Turkish perspective how does Bulgaria or Romania fit the Copenhagen uh, criteria while Turkey doesn't? A lot of e uh, EU scholars in Turkey ask that question. Exactly. One more thing. How does American democracy fit co uh, Copenhagen criteria? From the Copenhagen criteria, is the US a democracy of the same sort? Uh, that as, as the European states in the EU are. So all these questions that look at democracy from a more relativist perspective would be uh, uh, constructivist interpretations of uh, democratic peace. Okay? But from a realist perspective, you have common interests. From a realist perspective, how would we approach the, the, the existence of European Union? It's an intergovernmental um, structure where the power relations of each state determine what, what decisions will be made in the European Union. So 
the realists do not really talk about the European identity created by the, the European Union or the norms created by the European Union. Okay? From a realist perspective, the, the Europeans do not want another war in Europe after the second, uh, First and Second World Wars. And as a result, the best thing to do is to create a structure so that power relations can be managed in the most efficient way. Because there are common interests between the European nations. Okay? So guys, I looked at democratic peace from the liberal perspective, which created the democratic peace literature. And then I showed you realism and neorealism, how they would look at this, and then also constructivism. This is how you should actually get used to thinking. Okay? Whenever we talk about an issue, such as regime type in the international system, I want you to think of how I can view this from different international relations perspectives. Okay? Is it time to take a break? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll take the break now. Okay? And uh, I'm going to start with ideas in the next hour. Are you very tired? Are you doing okay? You're doing fine? Let's take a 10 minute break. Okay. <laughs>